Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Strand. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 92 years, Strand is a sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, running 400 events a year, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I'm excited to have with us Eve Rodsky, author of the brand brand new book, Fair Play, a game-changing solution for when you have too much to do and more life to live. A Reese Witherspoon book club pick and described by Pop Sugar as a must read when they named it to their best books of fall list, it builds on Eve's experience working in finance and philanthropy and as a wife and mother. Fair Play seeks and finds a completely new way to divvy up domestic responsibilities that help readers prioritize what's important to your family and who should take the lead on every bit of she fault shore work. Joining her to discuss it is Nicole Lappin, New York Times bestselling author of Rich Bitch, Boss Bitch, and most recently, Becoming Superwoman, also for sale here, <laughs> as well as the host of the nationally syndicated business reality competition show, Hatched. So without further ado, please welcome, join me in welcoming them to Strand. Ready to play fair, everybody? <laughs> I actually thought because we're in Strand, it feels like very academic. I like you, Ulysses is out here. I don't even know all of these amazing rare books. Shakespeare. Yes. Um, I thought we could do something academic to start out. What do you guys think about starting with a quiz? <laughs> So Eve is amazing in so many ways. Uh, a Harvard-educated lawyer, um, J.P. Morgan, took all of these processes that she had perfected in the corporate world in macroeconomics and brought it down to relationships in the division of power here and come up with amazing systems. But it's really illustrated by this. Guess what year these statements were made by working men, husbands? You can choose between 1969 and Pat Minardi. Who's that lady? She's one of the 750 articles and seminal books I, I read. Casual. Um, as I was researching the subject, I actually had to send away for it from a rare bookstore. Um, it was a pamphlet called The Politics of Housework from 1969. She interviewed men in 1969. I interviewed men and women, over 500 of them, in 2018. So this is a fun quiz from the book that will ask you who said it when. Yeah, so was it Pat or is it Eve? It, Pat in the politics of housework or Eve in her 2018 interviews? The first one is, I don't mind sharing the housework, but I don't do it very well. We should each do the things we're best at. 1969? Raise your hand. Or 2018? 2018. <laughs> what was it? 1969. 1969. You are so much better at the home stuff than me. 1969? 2018. You're right. Yes. 2018. We have different standards. Why should I do, what do I have to do to work to your standards? That's unfair. 19, 1969? Yeah. 2018. What was 1969. that? 1969. She's in charge of the house. It's not my job. 1969? <laughs> 2018. 2018. What great man would have to accomplish what he did if he had to do his own housework? That better be fucking 1969. <laughs> and I think it is, right? OK, good. All right, let's move on. <laughs> That tell you so you what you did all of this research between what was the sentiment in 1969 and what was the sentiment in 2018 what surprised you most I think what surprised me most was that nothing had changed and we've been talking about the gender division of labor which is also known as the second shift emotional labor or invisible work since Virginia Woolf wrote a book called Room of One's Own, where she argues that a woman can be Shakespeare because of too much of her domestic responsibilities. And so that was what I was trying to get out at that chapter, that for 100 years plus, women have been talking about this problem, but 
it's time to focus on solutions. And what are those solutions? And what is invisible work? I know there are a lot of terms for that very same idea. What is it? Is it mostly for women? It's a good question. Um, I'd say everything you need to le learn about invisible work, you can learn from just one word, and that word is mustard. And what I mean by that is somebody needs to know that your son only eats protein if he dips it in French's yellow mustard. So you notice that. That's what I call conception. Then somebody puts French's yellow mustard on a list along with other groceries for the week because their son likes it and that's how they eat their protein. That's what I call planning. Then someone actually has to get their butt to the store to go purchase the mustard. That's what I call execution. Now that's when men step in and that's a problem because inevitably the man brings home spicy Dijon. It just always happens. And then men are complaining to me all over America that they can't do anything right. And why should they go to the store for their wives if their wives are always complaining about what they bring home from the store? And then women are complaining to me all over America that you want me to trust my husband with my living will when he can't even bring home the right type of mustard? It's not gonna happen. And so then women take on more and more and more and it becomes what I call a trust spiral. Down and down and down. And the reason why I wanted to illustrate the conception of the planning the execution is because the studies show, and my research showed too, and a recent Harvard study just came out, which was very convenient in terms of timing for my book, that shows that women are holding the cognitive labor, the conception and the planning. And that's also called something, something called the mental load. And it's also what I call invisible work because all that planning and conception takes a lot of time. We value it in the business world, but we don't value it in the home. And so when you keep all those three things together, then things change, and that's what I saw all over America. So you went through it. CPEs is the process that you think couples should go through. Because like taking your kids to hockey or soccer practice is not just like taking them to the field, cheering, and then piecing out. There's so <laughs> much more. Yes, I, I love that you said that because this was how Seth and I started. We started, well, well, I'll tell you a little bit about, more about the origin story, but when we, when we got to a place where I could communicate effectively, which took some time, um, what was happening was Seth, I noticed, was telling everybody that he was in charge of extracurricular sports for our kids. And that to him meant showing up at Little League on Saturday. Now, what was happening to me is I was packing all the equipment behind the scenes to get him out the door, washing the uniforms, finding on Amazon whatever equipment they needed, like the cleats and helmet, um, applying sunscreen, getting their water Carpooling. bottle, carpools for practice, getting their water bottles ready, registering them for soccer, serving their friends. That's all the conception and planning, right? He saw the visible, which is... Again, the problem. When I finally got to sit down with Seth and say, this is what I mean when I want you to take over extracurricular sports, things started to change. But again, that took a while. So we, we had a long journey to that place. And how did you get to that place? Because you came up with all of that stuff that you mentioned from the sunscreen to the snacks to the registering. That is the shit you do that nobody sees. But you actually came up with the list. And what did you find from that? Well, I think every woman um, reaches her resentometer, or I say there's a resentometer, right? You can be at zero, two, three, four, five, six, ten. So the tens I saw out there were women who were telling me things like they dump wet clothes on their husband's pillow when they forget to put them in the dryer. Um, another woman told me she started an Instagram account called The Shit My Husband Doesn't Pick Up. <laughs> and she publicly shames him. And I don't think anybody would have actually believed me until just last week, a BuzzFeed article featured a woman in Japan who did the same thing, and she now has 500,000 followers. <laughs> so my breaking point was a day after my second son, Ben, was born, when I found myself sobbing on the side of the road over a text my husband sent me. And that text just said, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. And you can picture the scene, right? I'm, 
I have a breast pump and a diaper bag on the passenger seat. I have returns for the newborn in the back. I have a client contract on my lap, pen in my vagina, like as <laughs> I'm like trying. Around the vagina. Yeah, around the <laughs> vagina as I'm trying to mark up the contract at every. I bet you didn't think you'd hear that word tonight. Uh, every red traffic stop, as I'm trying to get to see, to go get my son Zach from his transition preschool, which in America, of course, is never long enough for working parents. It was like 15 minutes long. And I get this text from Seth. And so even though I was going to be late to pick up Zach, I pulled over and I just started crying. And I was thinking, as I was crying, that... I can't even manage a grocery list when I used to be able to manage employee teams. And more importantly, how did I become the default for literally every single household and childcare task for my family, including apparently being the fulfiller of my husband's blueberry smoothie needs? And so that's the day I knew something had to change. And that's when I started on this crazy quest through 750 articles and books and 500 interviews, men and women who mirrored the US Census. Um, and ultimately came up with fair play. And you guys made it through. We did. You I'm were still like, married. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and actually, Seth is home holding all of the cards. I have not received one text except for, hi, hope you're doing well. And my marriage is completely transformed. But the problem I have with books that are memoirs is that if I don't relate to your situation or your marriage, then I'm not going to really relate to your solution. So that's why this book took me seven years to write. And iterations of cards and cards and cards. And because I ultimately cared about the last chapter the most. And that chapter in the book is called The Top 13 Mistakes Couples Make and the Fair Play Fix. How was I going to get to all the mistakes if I didn't actually test the system? And I can assure you that it's been tested, again, with couples from all walks of life. And it's working. It's really working. And <clears throat> what people are telling me is that they're really responding to this idea of the home as an organization. Because what I like to say is that really at our core, if we think about it, our home is our most important organization. And it's time to treat it with some respect and some rigor. I wrote an article for Thrive, and it's called The Three Most Toxic Words in a Relationship. And those words in my data were figure it out. Everybody says, we'll figure it out. Men say that when I ask them, how are you going to handle the gender division of labor after children? Oh, we're totally going to figure it out. Or not, and then it just defaults onto the woman. And then women were saying things to me when they were at, like, dumping wet clothes on their husband's pillow, resentometer level, that I'm freaking done. I'm just going to have him figure it out. It's just not a productive way to treat the most important organization. Imagine walking into your boss's office in the morning tomorrow and saying, hey, I'm, what should we be doing today? I'm just going to sit here and wait for you to tell me what to do. How long would you last in that job? But we're lasting in the home like that every single day. And 25% of divorces are linked directly to the unfairness of the division of labor in the home. And we haven't figured it out since 1969. And that quiz, we have not figured it out. And it was so cute when Eve posted on Instagram, everybody should follow her at Eve Rodsky and her at Fair Play Life uh, account. He's like on the couch. You found him on a Nest Cam or something reading your book? Yes, well, that was so Yes, cute. it wasn't my husband. It was a random person who DM'd me who said that she was out and she just put the Nest Camera on to check on her kid, and actually she found her husband reading Fair Play on the couch. It was a really, really beautiful moment for me. And actually, the most surprising finding has been from the hundreds, literally the hundreds of responses I've received on info at Eve Rodsky, or Eve at Eve Rodsky this week, um, someone's been helping me collate them, and they told me this morning that 70% are men. How freaking cool is that? And no, it's super cool. And the idea of Seth holding the cards is really important. Can you explain that? Because the fair play idea isn't that it's like 50 50. We, we constantly have that idea. Why is that a misconception? It's, thank you for asking. That's a good question. Um, I fundamentally, to my core, based on my data and research, believe that 50 50 is not only the wrong equation, but it's held us back for 100 years. Because 
ultimately that's about scorekeeping that you actually can't keep up with. So I've, again, since we're an academic place, I'll talk about something that got cut out of the book, but that I really loved. I um, have Ms. Magazine, lots of feminist uh, propaganda in my house from my mother, who Eric back there knows very well, my single mother, Terry. Uh, one of them is the first Ms. Magazine issue, and it was framed on my wall. And I remember from just, it triggered seeing it over and over again growing up, but that one of the articles said something like, how to get to 50-50 in your home. Follow the couple that'll get you there. So I became obsessed with finding that inaugural issue and finding that couple. So they were called the BIMS. And I found them, I found an obituary for the woman. And the whole obituary was about how she and her husband were trying their best to be equal at everything. Take one, I don't even know how you do that, right? Do one dishes this time, I'll do one dishes this time. Just completely 50-50 in the home. And then it talks about how her, she divorced because her husband ended up doing nothing and she raised her kids by herself. So why I think that's unfair, right, is I'm sitting there looking at this beacon of what should be this feminist idea, but no one's telling us the real story about what happens behind the scenes to the BEMS, to everybody who strives for that. So instead, when you focus on ownership, things change right away and it doesn't have to be 50-50. In fact, it isn't because that's scorekeeping. But it can, change can start with just one card, like it did with me in the extracurricular card with Seth. So stop thinking about it as like these scale, the two yeah, stupid yeah, bowls yeah. with Lady Justice, right, right, right. and start thinking about it like a card game? Exactly, like a card game. So I've been working with cards for about a decade as a mediator. Um, I, I'm a philanthropic advisor by, by day, which most of you have no idea what that means, but you could just picture the HBO show Succession, and those are my clients. <laughs> so you should feel bad for me. But what I've been doing is bringing domestic harmony to these families, and really it's about, it's never again about sort of scorekeeping or how you communicate. It all comes down to values. Everything comes down to values. So it's a card game, but it doesn't work like a normal card game that would just be another list. You take dishes, I take laundry, you take this. It doesn't, that's when the system fails. It's actually the only time I've seen the system fail is when couples are so far up the resentometer, they don't wanna take the time to have some difficult discussions that are made fun by a card game that Fair Play asks you to do. Now again, these discussions are about 20 minutes. I ask women to have these discussions and I look at their screen time apps and they're on their social media, Facebook, Instagram, for three hours and 45 minutes and they're telling me it's too hard to have a 20 minute conversation over the card game, right? So let's, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror too. So what I mean by values is for things to change in our home, besides this idea of ownership, was this idea of what do you value? And I can learn so much more about your household, about a conversation I'll have with you and your husband around garbage, than I can around any of these esoteric love languages or other things. And what I mean is that as we were doing Fair Play and I was thinking about ownership, I gave Seth the garbage card. But I was following him around all day. <laughs> making sure he was about to take out the garbage. And I was staring at him, and he's like, why are you behind my shoulder again? I'm like, oh, nothing, just seeing what you're doing in the kitchen. And sort of waiting for him to do what I asked him to do, right? Because he's supposed to be in charge of garbage. And putting a liner up on the, on the sink, you know, next to the sink, if, if he wasn't putting it back in the bin. And he's like, okay, this is just not working. Like, you gotta chill out with the garbage. And so, I took a playbook from my mediation and said, maybe there needs to be a step before you divide. So let's go back to values. And so I sat down with Seth and I said, okay, here's my thing about garbage. We didn't have a garbage can in my house. We had a Chinese takeout bag that my mother put on a knob and garbage would literally spill out on our floor every single day. And when I try to get water, that's why I was dehydrated as a child. When I try to go get water on Avenue C and 14th Street, um, after hours, if I went into the kitchen and s turned on the light, there'd be hundreds of cockroaches that would scur scurry as I would try to get water. So I have a lot of trigger over garbage. <laughs> and when I brought it back to my value of a tidy home, because it 
was the opposite of how I grew up and it was really important to me because it triggered a lot of pain in my childhood. Seth heard me and then he relays a story of how he was in a fraternity and they would live with 30 pizza boxes and they slept with the boxes and it didn't really <laughs> bother him that garbage was like their other roommate, you know, <laughs> including pizza boxes. And so we both said, like, we have very different values over garbage. And so then I started borrowing from the language that I use as a mediator and also is used by a trillion dollar tort system, which is the reasonable person standard. We adjudicate everything in this country based on a reasonable person standard. So then we started asking each other, what's reasonable? And Seth said, well, what feels reasonable to me is I'm happy to take this responsibility. If you never freaking mention the word garbage again, it'll go out at 7 o'clock every night. I'll put it into my calendar as an appointment. And since then, garbage has been going out in my house every single night at 7 p.m. And there's a liner that goes back in the bin. <laughs> and that's it. So, yes, it was a strange 20-minute conversation over garbage. <laughs> but it's now allowing me so much mental relief less stress, and really actually more time because I would have taken over that card again. Because it's not about the garbage. It's not about the blueberries. It's not about the mustard. It's about so much more than that. And how many of us are having these types of conversations with our significant other now? about division, Thank you for being honest back there for us. Yeah, power and fighting around it. It's probably one of the most frequently sources of fights among couples or maybe even divorce. So what can people do right now? Because what you do is so great is take memoir elements, as you mentioned, but then infuse systems that everybody can look at and take away for themselves. So what can you implement now? Well, I'm really, I, the good news is you all got these promotional cards that are not available for sale yet until next year. So I um, want you to read the book and do no harm by do not playing the cards until you read the whole book. Because again, this is not about scorekeeping, but I'm asking you all to go home and play. You have all the tools you need in the book. You have supplementary cards if you want them. Go home and play after you read it. Obviously, let the first chapters digest because there's some wake awakening we have to do. Um, and I want to just talk a, a little bit about that awakening because I think this is really important to, for women. One is about how we communicate. Number one finding was, again, women saying to me they don't want to have conversations over this issue, and then they end up dumping wet clothes or publicly shaming their husbands. So what I like to say is I'm not asking for a conversation to start. Because I promise every single one of you out there, you are already communicating. You are already communicating. So I'm asking for a conversation shift. And I think when I said that to women, they got a little bit less anxious. Because if they realize that they're already communicating, okay, then maybe I'll just try to communicate in a different way. The other important piece of work we have to do in ourselves before we and you'll see it in the book, before we start to play, is understand how men, women, and society view time. Because this is the crux of fair play. The crux of my findings was that men, women, and society do not value women's time the same as men's time. Men's time is viewed as finite, like diamonds, whereas women's time is viewed as infinite, like sand. And the crux of that is, and I'll just say how I found like, my favorite interviews. My favorite interviews were men and women with the same job. Two shipping supervisors, two pediatricians, two colorectal surgeons. And I would ask the man, why is your wife still getting the phone calls from the school and you're picking, your wife's picking them up during the day? Why um, is your wife still packing lunches and registering your kids for extracurricular sports. And a lot of times men would say, well, I just, I'm so busy, I don't really have time, and she's just better at it. Whereas women would say to me, oh, I just find the time. Unless we're Albert Einstein and we can fuck with the space-time continuum, <laughs> there is no way to find time. It's just about how we choose to use our time. And women have a lot less time choice over their time. But the, here's the rub. So that was happening with men. But the worst perpetrators of what I call toxic time messages were women. Women are not valuing their own time. The number one thing women said to me when I asked them, why is this a, there an imbalance in your house over the cards, was I'm wired differently. I'm a better multitasker. So the beauty of my job is my clients fund the top researchers in this country. So I got to call them up and say, 
are women better multitaskers? Well, as you can imagine, the answers are resounding no. And actually, I didn't put this in the book because I didn't want to burst women's bubble, but men are actually a little bit slightly better multitaskers than we are. Um, but that doesn't matter because it, multitasking is bad for everyone. And when you use that ex excuse that I'm a better multitasker, um, it's really toxic. And one neuroscientist said something to me off the record that he said I could use for the tour, but he didn't want to put in the book, was very profound. He said to me, imagine, Eve, if you could convince half the population that they were better at wiping asses and doing dishes. How great for the other half of the population. <laughs> and guess what? I saw Forbes last week. There's 100 CEOs on their most powerful CEOs, and guess what 99 of them have in common? They're all men. So that's what's happening in chapter two, the most important chapter in the book, which is a rule number one, chapter two or three, is I help women debunk all of these messages we give ourselves for why our time is not as valuable as men's. When we reframe time as we both have 24 hours in a day, things start to change. You can always get more money, can't get more time. That's correct. But we have time for some questions. Mm -hmm. First two people that ask a question oh. get a book. Yeah. What about if you don't work full time and your husband does? What is your response? Oh, what is your advice if you don't work full time and your husband does as to why that is an acceptable excuse for your time to be maybe less valued or for you to carry a substantially heavier load of the cards? Um, one of the main things that men said to me were, I don't do anything in my home because I make more money than my wife. And those are my power hours. And the stuff in the home is just not as valuable. I also had another man say to me, well, I don't have tits and that's why I don't do that. Um, this is 2018, people. Um, that's just a trope. So the problem with, with that type of reasoning that I do more because I make less is women will always make less because we're paid less for the same jobs. <laughs> I'm not allowed to choose a career in philanthropy because I make less and my husband chooses business. So then I end up with all the mental load of taking care of our kids. It's just time is money is a toxic, toxic message. And America has given us that message. It is about connection and values and time. And so when men, when I was able to reframe for men, even the most conservative men, why doing stuff in the home was valuable, things change. And I didn't have to lecture them. I just gave them some tools. And I'll give you one final example of a story, and then I know we have to take more questions. It's a two-minute story, so stay with me. Julie and Ed, very traditional man, very traditional man, one of the men that may have said to me, I don't have tits and that's why I don't do it. Um, his wife, Julie, wanted to try fair play uh, around the holidays. So first of all, it's a terrible time to try fair play because the holidays are extremely stressful and when motion is high, cognition is low. But I said, okay, Julie, I'll try to help you with that. And so she said to me, Ed wants to be helpful. He's, you know, he's, he, un he believes in systems. He was an athlete and he understands your thinking around systems because any coach will tell you the belief in systems. So I'm already, you know, penetrating Ed's mind a little bit more than maybe other gender division of labor books have. And he wants to be helpful. And, and I say, well, why do you want to do this now? And she says, well, I'm at my breaking point. My mother just got sick. She's in the hospital. It's the holidays. I'm supposed to be planning our travel decorating a Christmas tree, still taking my kids to school, feeding them lunch, I mean, packing their school lunches, picking them up, I'm at my breaking point. So I said, well, what's breaking you? What's the breaking point? And she said, my younger son Brody's second grade Secret Santa project, because it's a craft project that has to be made from scratch. Thank you schools for doing that to us in the holidays. And so she said, well, typically I would, give Ed a list of what I need to build this project, and I would be building it with Brody when I get back from the hospital, but you're telling me not to do that. You're telling me to hand over ownership of the homework card for this one project. And I said, yeah, I'm telling you to do that. And she said, well, I have no idea how to even start because that's not our habit. So just like I did for my garbage situation, I took her back to the values, and I said, why is this matter to you? Why is this project so triggering? And she tells me that it, the second grade project in their school is a 
seminal, like a signature project because it's supposed to teach that materialism around holidays is not always the best thing. That it's not about the gifts. That homemade gifts can be just as nice as store-bought gifts that you ask for from Santa. And so she wants to teach Brody that materialism is, you know, around the holidays is not the best, you know, lesson. So I said, that's very profound. Thank you for telling me that. Is there anything else? And she says, well, Brody drew the new girl in school. She doesn't have a lot of friends. She's, I, she looks like she's being bullied, you know, fr from some of the girls at school. And I, I keep thinking, like, how nice would it be if my, like, more popular athletic child made a really nice gift for this little girl? So she had me tearing up. So I kept thinking, just say that to Ed. And so I asked her to just do that. Traditional Ed, so, who doesn't hold, never going to hold 50% of the cards because he works full time and she, she does as well, but he thinks time is money and he makes a lot more money than she does. So Ed then tells me that he takes over and he starts Googling Secret Santa projects for little girls. And on YouTube, they're looking at projects and they decide on a popsicle stick jewelry box. That's conception. And then he writes down with his son everything they need to complete the jewelry box. Uh, colored popsicle sticks, glue, glitter. Even, Ed's all excited about this, which is so cool. Even a knob, because I guess Brody doesn't want the little girl to have to use two hands to uncover her jewelry box, so she, he wants her to have a knob on her jewelry box. That's what I call planning. And then he tells me that he discovered this really cool store named Michael's, <laughs> and you can get like everything you need from, a, from this one store and, uh, <laughs> and you don't have to go that many places and it's super easy. So I just took Brody to this one store called Michael's and they had everything we needed, glue, the glitter, the popsicle tips, sticks. of course, that yeah, you tips, need exactly, to yeah. do all home stuff. So he finds this and then they come back home and they start building the, the, the jewelry box. And then Julie tells me, she chimes in that, she's like, my life changed in that moment. And I said, okay, that's pretty profound. What changed about your life? And she said, I saw glitter on my husband's hands. And I said, well, why was that so moving to you? And she said, because at that moment, I knew he was in it with me. And so I just kept thinking since I worked with Julian Ed. Yeah, what if, we, what if men all over have glitter on their hands? regardless of whether their wives work out of their homes. How much more meaningful for society and actually more meaningful for the men? You can't even imagine this week's the type of text I'm getting from men. Men who consider themselves traditional or not, they are saying things from, I'm reading this book, I want to be a better partner, to how many cards do I need to take not to be a douchebag? <laughs> and so that's the power of... The, opening up these types of conversations. Well, I think they want to not be a douchebag, hopefully, but there's not a manual, so this is the manual to do that. Yes. The non-douchebag manual. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, you and I went to high school together, so. Yes, we're um, very good friends from high school. <laughs> my mom used to do her hair. Yes. Um, so I double what my husband makes, um, but he still expects me to do everything, and I still have all the information in my head. How do I start to download all of this information to him without like overwhelming him or just feeling like a bitch? <laughs> a rich bitch? Yes. Or, okay. I mean, you yeah. are. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I give all those answers in the book. But as I said to you, it starts with starting with one card. Pick the one card that you both value equally and just start with one. Because what I found with Ed, and just taking literally one homework project for one week for one of his children, was that he began to have empathy for the conception and the planning, for the mental load. It takes a lot of work. I'll give you an example, one last Seth example. He took school transitions for Anna this year. She's transitioning to new school. Um, you know, it's one of those require you to be on campus for 10 years. Uh, for your whole entire day. So I overheard him talking to another man um, at, we were, you know, I don't know, at a school, another school fun function. And he said to this guy, he said, it's so weird that Zach and Ben didn't have to 
do this crazy transition program. <laughs> yeah. He's like, it's super intense. So weird. Yeah, so that's how. You start with empathy, you start with one card, and you do it on Valentine's Day or an anniversary or when you could be generous with each other. The hardest thing for women, I found, was the rule when I say no feedback in the moment. Women love to give feedback in the moment. How do it's you a not? really cool thing for feedback in the moment. So I've been practicing this like transcendental meditation or anything, any other type of practice. It takes practice. I do not give feedback in the moment because I know that my, su my husband will be willing to hear me during our check-in time. And we prioritize our check-in like an episode of The Bachelor. We never miss it. We do it, we used to do it on Friday nights. It was our short-term reward substitution. That's a behavioral economist named Dan Ariely's suggestion for how you get started. Do it over something really fun like tacos and tequila. So we did that. And now, because we're living the system for so long, we just do it from 11 to 11.30 on the phone. Because, you know, you get it down. But one last thing I will say about what Dan Ariely says about people who say, in the time it takes me for him, in the time it takes him for, in the time it takes him to do it, or for me to tell him how to do it, I might as well do it myself. Because that was another toxic time message women were giving themselves, was he said that's incredibly short-term thinking. He said if they knew anything about economics or behavioral economics, they would never say that. Because that short-term thinking is actually gonna eat up hours and hours and hours of your life if you actually thought about your life as more than just the next month ahead of you. Because when you give someone context, you relieve hours and hours later, but it's very hard in the moment to give that over. Um, so you invest in the time and in the context. So if you pick the card, you have to do soup to nuts. Soup to nuts, own your shit. <laughs> own your shit. That was a really long answer to my friend's question, Rebecca back there, who's amazing by the way, and was super helpful in writing the cards with me and helping me test the system. Hi, uh, so I just had a question about how this system and your process would look different or translate to couples or partners who don't have children. Oh, that's a great question. And actually, no one's asked me that yet. Um, there's 60 cards that apply to couples without kids. Um, and you add 40 when you have children. So for those of you who don't have children, you may actually not want to have children. <laughs> 40 cards. And 43 steps in your morning routine. Just FYI. Um, so you play, you play with just 60, 60 cards. Your deck is smaller, which means you like each other more because you're not fighting over as many cards. And one thing I will say about that is another toxic message that I don't really put in the book because it's said by other feminists is the best decision you can make is the man you marry. Where I'm here to tell you that the data shows that the man you marry is not the same person that you are with after children. Because men do between five to 15 hours less for each child that comes along. And there's a lot of blame on women of this maternal gatekeeping, but I have no idea why that's happening. I couldn't figure out that, that phenomenon, but it's just a phenomenon. So to actually be married to the man that you married, that's where fair play comes in. It's all about expectations. And, and birth control. And birth control, <laughs> yes. Hi, um, I am, I'm just so excited to read this book because I have three kids, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a nine-month-old, and I did the Google sheet that I think you did um, a year ago and added up all the time, and a year later, nothing has changed um, other than the resentment factor growing. Can you give any short, how can you educate the man without having to read the book um, if he hasn't got seven hours to do it to get him on the same page, or is it just a sit-down conversation? And do you recommend at any point when you have too many cards, just putting them all down and literally stopping, going on strike, and re-picking them up to start dishing them out fairly? Really good question. Actually, I like that you mentioned strike, because I want to just talk to you about the other non-fair play narratives going on about the home. The Guardian just had a big piece where the solution was walk out, like the 1970s sex strikes. Um, my, some of my favorite. Um, a big viral Today article just came out saying the only solution to this issue is a divorce. Um, my favorite is a New York Times article 
that says the, the only way to solve this issue is to move to a foreign country where your husband knows the language, but you don't, so that he has to fill out the school forms. <laughs> I would love to live on the beaches of Ibiza. I really would, because Seth's a great Spanish speaker. She's not going to be so good for my career or the rest of my life. So that's the solutions. And when you just said, you know, well, he may not have seven hours to read this. Well, that's similar to what a lot of men said to me about not having time to do anything, right? The, men, the men, women and men with the two jobs, the same jobs, I'm asking the men why he's not doing anything. Well, I don't have the time. So again, that's, that's back to how men value their time versus how women value their time. So I would just say, like, read it. I don't strike, but read it. Um, men who are reading it are get the, getting the most out of it. The other thing you can do is I actually give you a paperless post with a value proposition for men. And this came, again, from my most traditional men who said, I need a value proposition because why would I just do more work? It doesn't seem like there's anything in it for me. And I had women say to me, why do I have to be the one educating my husband because I'm the one who's aggrieved? Yeah, it sucks. It sucks, but if you want to wait for your husband to bring this to the table, you're going to be waiting for another 100 years or for another Pat Maynardy quiz in like the year 3018. So it requires communication, but I give you all the tools to do that. So if he doesn't want to read the whole book, at least have him read my paperless post, which gives him the, the value proposition for men. That's digestible. Can I actually ask you a question? What did you, when you did your Google Doc, what were you surprised to find and did you show it to your husband? Um, I was surprised when I added it up how I even had time to sleep. And I was surprised when I showed it to him that it was the same as, I think, I listened to some of the audiobook, the emoji of just like, he was just overwhelmed. He couldn't even hear it because it was too stressful for him to even sit down and talk it through. It just made him feel... I think, frustrated and shamed that I was trying to ask him to do more work and he couldn't handle it. And so it was just a wall. Yes, and um, what you're referring to is a, the shit I do spreadsheet that I created on my path to fair play, which um, was the most beautiful 98 tab spreadsheet that uh, anyone's ever created. And it had uh, 15 to 20 items of subtasks in each category. So there's over a thousand items of invisible work. Um, so proud of the spreadsheet. I had friends crowdsource it with me. I had friend, women I didn't know adding to it, saying things like, uh, I don't see sunscreen on here. And I would say, oh my God, you don't know how to use Excel. You gotta scroll right, lady. Like, you're looking at 15 tabs. There's 98 tabs on this thing. So if you look at tab 72 under medical and healthy living, um, item number 17 says apply sunscreen. And then other women would say to me, well, I don't see allowance. And I'd say, well, yeah, go to, um, tab 36 under, you probably wouldn't know it was under there because it's under something called family values and traditions. Because otherwise, why are you doing allowance unless you're teaching your children something? But I promise you allowance is in there. <laughs> so this crowdsource spreadsheet was really a labor of love. But what I realized is just unleashed another rant. My husband, when I sent it off, the 17,000 megabyte spreadsheet to him uh, with the can't wait to discuss uh, subject line, <laughs> Um, I got just literally one monkey emoji. I didn't even get the courtesy of the three monkey Which trio. With the, 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 the see no I've, evil. Yeah. See no evil. So there was see no evil going on in my house. But in other houses, this shit I do spreadsheet unleashed a shit storm. I have women texting me saying, WTF, I'm doing everything. Another woman said to me, at this rate, I'm not staying in my marriage. And so I realized, lists alone don't work. I set up a rant without a solution. The only solution is what we do in business. And the best companies do something called context, not control. Not go pick up the glue stick, because I actually have a man who told me in White Plains, New York, he was locked out of his house over a glue stick, because he forgot to bring home a glue stick. And he's driving around White Plains thinking, do I go into the city and just get a hotel room? Do I like wait till my <laughs> wife cools off? Um, and you can imagine her perspective, right? She'd been working three weeks on the biography project. All she needed was the glue to, to put the pictures of Einstein or whatever onto the damn poster board. But what context not control does, and that's the CPE thing, when you get the tools and you say you're holding the full card and this is what it's meant to me, and you start with one, men can hear it. And because they also say like back the F off me then, back off. Because if we're doing it at a reasonable standard, that's enough. And for our house, it was garbage going out at 7 o'clock every night. It wasn't me following my husband around the house with a garbage liner seeing if he was going to put it back into the bin. <laughs> and so we have to also take some responsibility for how we're communicating. And so that's why I say it's read the book, digest some of those communication tools. And if you're still scared to have these conversations, 
Surround yourself with what I call spiritual friends. I have so many of you in this room that are spiritual friends who've helped me along this process, including Alexis, Professor Jamal right here, Samantha Rose, Michelle Howery, Alexis, um, Natalie, Zoe. Um, so many people here who have helped me on this process. Madeline, um, my brother Josh, who lived in my household, so he got to experience no garbage can as well with me. Um, and you surround yourself with spiritual friends. And what I mean by spiritual friends, not every friend is a spiritual friend, but I interviewed a lot of clergy for this book. Priests, Episcopalian priests, rabbis. This one rabbi said to me, this, she introduced this concept of spiritual friendship to me. And she described it as friends who wake you up when you're sleeping, who say to you, I see you. And I know there's somebody vibrant and amazing in there. And that was who you were before children. And I'm gonna bring you back. But I'm not gonna bring you back with some annoying find your passion article that I just forward to you and with a big you know, balloon emoji. You're gonna say, I understand that you're not gonna find your passion. You're not gonna even have time for self-care unless you find domestic rebalance. And so I actually found it very condescending to have all these articles. What's your passion? Find your purpose. Because I had no fucking time to find my purpose. I was busy writing, creating a 98 tab spreadsheet <laughs> of all the shit I do. So it was only until I could do my rebalance that I could sit down to write this book. It took me seven years. Maybe it would have taken me three years and this would have been out in the, earl in the world earlier if I had been able to rebalance earlier. But I do thank Seth because if he hadn't sent me that blueberry text, maybe I wouldn't have gone down this road. Why did you decide to do a book though? And seven years, yeah. seven year birth. A birth. This is the, I try to find an animal that had like a seven year gestation period to try to make it analogous. Um, and you lived right around the corner, you guys. Yes. And, did, and this was your bookstore. Did you think you would be an author? When no. did that happen? I did never thought I would be an author, but I did know that the system was working. But I knew that it was more than just a card game. Because A, this concept of unicorn space was coming up over and over again for women. This idea that I don't recognize who I am after children. This is not the career and marriage combo I thought I'd have. Or I don't even have a career anymore and I have three Ivy League degrees. Um, I had one woman say, I'm, I just was, one day I just found myself with my three Ivy League degrees banging a spoon on my head for 20 minutes. And then I looked up and I was like, am I playing parade? Like, I forget, what, what am I doing here, right? And other women saying things to me like, when I'd say, come on, you're, you're the most amazing speaker I know. You were the most amazing management consultant I know. You're into politics. And then women would say to me, no, I'm just not interested because I'm an object at rest. And it's just physics. Objects in motion stay in motion, and I've turned into an object at rest. So that data, coupled with the fact that the game needed to have some awakening chapters, meant that it couldn't just be a card game. It had to be a book. Because it will not work if you just go to the South Beach Shia chapters of what to eat. You have to read the first four, four rules first, because consciousness, as a Lex Professor Jamal will tell you, my mother talks about this in her and her social work classes as well. When you go from pre-consciousness to consciousness, that's the first step. Scary step though. It really is a scary step. But that's why you have spiritual friends to help you on that journey. And we have time for one more question. Hi, Eve. I'm not sure I've seen you since Harvard Law School, oh but my not God. surprised Hi. by your success. And I wanted to ask you a question about success, because I really do believe that you have the power with this book to make cultural change and social change and change the conversation for so many couples and families in this country. How will we, as individuals, define success when we use your system? Thank you so much. It was a great thank you. That was very complimentary. You made me tear up. Well, you can first define success by playing it forward. So getting the book for somebody who you may think needed. I think that's really important, too, to say, I'll do this with you, and we, it won't be scary, or let's do it as a group. You know? And I think what success is for me is just as simple as Ed with his glitter on his hands. I'm not asking for men to hold 50, 50 of the 100 card deck. 
because that will never happen. Just like the Bems will end up with an unfinished story of someone who ended up divorcing over invisible work in the home. What I see with success is, is just a little bit more empathy, a little bit more values, and a little bit more rigor and respect for our home organization. That's it. Where you communicate with a little bit more respect, where you say, you know what, maybe I shouldn't give feedback in the moment. There's so many takeaways. Does, you don't have to even play the full game. But if you do, you'll be, as my husband said to me, hopefully driving around with a bumper sticker that he wants to make me that says, your CPE means so much to me. <laughs> That's a bumper sticker he said he sh I should create for our car. It's an amazing poet. So it's similar, it sounds like, between running your life like a business and just going balls to the wall with like free for all. And I think, is the answer the gamification that you've done here in the process? Yes, I think the, that's a really great question. Um, yes, gamification is really important. And as I was saying before, uh, 10 years of using cards in my mediation practice. So back to the HBO show, show Succession clients that I have, um, those men and women too don't think they're ever gonna die. And so I don't know if you heard her Summer Redstone story or any of those stories. And so I'm here to talk to them about their succession for their family foundations and businesses. How are they going to do that? Well, again, when someone says to me, well, I'm not going to die, it sort of cuts off our conversation. So what I started introducing was values cards and legacy cards. And even the most traditional men were willing to look at the cards and play my game. And I realized that difficult conversations can be had, but they are way easier if you have gamification. And so that's really what the, that's the whole premise. And I think maybe the truth is somewhere in between, I'm gonna live forever and I'm gonna die tomorrow. Right, that's and right. And in between, put glitter on your hands, everybody. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And Eva's she has the most amazing book. And thank you for, for supporting me.